Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where we're going to be speaking with Heather Morris. Hello. Hello. Who is the author of The Tattooist of Auschwitz and Silka's Journey. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. I learned last night that mm -hmm. The Tattooist of Auschwitz is now sold in 39 countries, with the latest being Thailand. Is that correct? I correct you. It's actually 53. 53 countries. 53. 47 translations. Wow. Wow. And... It is this one I know I have right. It was number one on the New York Times list last week. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was for the 59th week that it's been on the Times list, which is amazing. Yes. And Silka's Journey came on the list three weeks ago and hit immediately. So you've got an instant New York Times bestsellers. And I am very, very impressed with that because I know how tough that is to do. Yeah, and um, I can't process it. It's a crazy talk. <laughs> it's crazy talk to just see what has happened. Well, I wanted to talk my start my talk about what the year has been like for you as you've watched The Tattooist as Auschwitz just take off and become this huge success. Yeah. What's this been like? I'm watching it from so many different countries and seeing how it only came out in the States nine months after it was released in the UK and Australia. And we had this um, background to it's doing well in these countries. What's it going to do in the States? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And it did, it took off. And we like to think apparently it's word of mouth is what contributed to that. So thank you to all those people who spread my word Learned of mouth. mouth. Right, I, right, right. I do appreciate it. Uh, I, I remember seeing it on the Times list and calling the publisher and going, can you get this book over to me? Like, what is this? I need yeah. to see this book. I need to know what's happening. So when you were doing this, there have been so many books written about the Holocaust. I mean, there, mm -hmm. we're, we're not a shortage of material. Why do you think that this one struck such a, uh, such a nerve with people, that people were really excited about reading it? What do you think it was? You know, initially I didn't know. I tried to figure it out. And then last April, I was at uh, Krakow, Auschwitz, with a group of young students, Jewish students, who gather there for the March of the Living every year. And they didn't know about the book because it wasn't out in the States yet. And I was about 400 young students from LA and Florida and had dinner with them. And one of their rabbis said to me, who are you? And I'm the stranger from Australia. And I told him, and they asked me what I talked to the students after dinner. Now that day, we had been traveling around Auschwitz and Birkenau for the first time. And I looked at these kids, they're 16, 17, and they were traumatized. They were com comforting each other. Mm. There was no question that the last thing they wanted to do was sit down and listen to this old biddy telling them what they had just been uh, witnessing and hearing from experienced guides. So I went, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give them five minutes. So they took all the kids out and put them on the grass outside this little community centre. And I stood on the steps going into it. An hour later, they interrupted me because the students were just so engaged with what I was saying. Now they asked those kids, when we got back to the hotel, the Australian uh, chap came to me and he said, oh, look, some of the teachers of the Americans want to see you downstairs in a room. <laughs> and I go, uh-oh. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Being asked to see teachers is never a good thing, either for me personally or my children. <laughs> right, right, right. So I went down and there were half a dozen uh, teachers and rabbis and counsellors in a room. And they said they'd grabbed about a dozen kids when they got back to the hotel before they went to bed, took them into a room and said, what did we just see there? What happened tonight? And they said, they looked at us as if we were just stupid adults. And they said, you have been telling us today, and we have known for so long, that six million of us died during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Today you took us to Auschwitz and told us one and a half million Jewish men, women and children died here. She spoke about the one. Mm -hmm. We could relate to that. Mm -hmm. And telling that one story and mm. what's going on. And it leads right to my question is, Lolly was a personality. And do you mm. think that his wit and his quick thinking of, you know, just telling his story of like, you know, what his life and back, but he was that personality. Do you think that that helped him during the time that he was there because yeah. he was? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes, you can have wit and you can have that charm that he did have in spades. However, he said that every day he still considered himself to be just lucky. Mm -hmm. But he also, what I would call an opportunist, mm -hmm. he said, I never took step anywhere without looking around to see where the dangers were. Mm -hmm. He knew not to blindly uh, walk down into blocks or into areas without pausing and looking around. So he was pretty savvy about what's going on around me. He was looking around what was going on and also judging a situation. If someone mm -hmm. came up to him, 
he was trying to assess them as he was t- tattooing them and saying, like, wait a second, who yeah. do I know about them? It's- yeah, it got him into trouble a couple of times too because mm-hmm. his anger would o- overcame him several times. Mm-hmm. He said, and he uh, would smack himself around because he did put himself and by default get her at risk at many risks. times. Yeah. And that guard of his, Beretsky, he lauded that over him. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Gita. Yes, we have Gita, and we're watching her, and we can see what's going on. Now, I'm going to make a confession that I did read the books out of order, because even though oh, I got the tattooist right. last year, I did not read it immediately. And I, as soon as Silka came to my house, I was like, I'm going to read this right now. And I actually, the books, first of all, can be read out of yeah, order. Standalone. They're both complete you know, stories unto themselves. But I actually enjoyed doing this because then when I went back and I found the seeds of where mm-hmm. Silka's story was and Tattooist, I found that, look at this little tiny thread that you then saw something from and heard from people and his line about her, which is, she's the bravest person, not I the bravest girl knew. I've ever met. Yeah. I ever knew. But see, I did that because I only got a one book deal. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you've only got a one book deal and you're writing the Tattooist and you're wanting to honor a promise to Lully. You tell my story, then you tell Silka's. Mm-hmm. And I had to just pepper her in there. Just put, she was in there just a little mm-hmm. bit. She was not in there that much. But the catalyst was him saying that. Did you um, know, like for readers who don't know her story, how was she so brave? What did she do that was so special that he was seeing, you know, in this camp? What had she done there that he but, shared? Yeah, she chose to survive at all costs. Mm-hmm. And having to endure what she did, being raped by the Commandant in Birkenau at his will. Uh, she could have given up at any time, and she spoke to Lally about that. And you can't imagine what it's like to sit with an 88-year-old man who finally is going to tell you that the worst day in his life, and he had many of them there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was the day he sat with this 16-year-old girl. 16. 16. I mean, 16 and, years old. And yeah. said, you have no option if you want to live. You have to give in. Mm-hmm. And you it's, can't say no. You cannot fight. And if you do, if if, if you don't do that, it's you're going to die. Instant. If you don't do that, yeah, what's going to happen? Was, the Schwarzenegger would have probably killed her with his own bare hands. Right. So okay. So what we have at this point is so she's survived Auschwitz Birkenau. She's yeah. survived everything that's going on, and then she finds that they tell her she is colluded with the enemy, which is prostituting yourself to the enemy. Gosh, prostituting don't get yourself that. to the enemy. And now you are going to be sentenced to another 15 years, was yeah, it? 15, 15 years. So it's like more than three times where you've already been. Uh-huh. And you're going to someplace you don't know because, I mean, let's face it, we now know what a gulag was. We now yes. know what Siberia was. There was no, you're getting on the train and you know what's going to happen. No. The experience of that had to be completely harrowing for a young girl who also does not know exactly what's happened to her family except her mother. She doesn't exactly. know at this point. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And the fact that it took, I believe, about two weeks in that train trip to get her from Krakow mm-hmm. to the part in Siberia where she was, never knowing where you were going to end up and what was going to happen when you got there. Was it back to the same? Was it a death camp? Right. Yeah, all of that, she would have had no, no idea. Were the sentences that were done to go to these camps kind of arbitrary, like the gulag? Yeah. Because it seems like 15 years, it's, is that, and then somebody else gets five or somebody else, because people did leave while she was there. Yes. So mm. were the times like, in your research, were those kind of arbitrary? Uh, totally. But I can only presume that because she was given a sentence, she knew or hoped she had an end date. Right, right. The thing about going into Auschwitz Birkenau, you had no idea. Right, it, that, that was just well, on and on. And I presume, I can, we only presume that, that having an end date or a hoped for end date, that helped her another year, another year. And she counted it out by the White Knights. Well, that gulag was such a rough place. It's the Verkuta um, gulag. Gusha, yeah. Is that the was that the worst of the gulags? I mean, not that there's any great gulag. Or in your research, was that one that was colder and darker and danker than the others? Here's the thing: when I was wanting to research about gulags, I decided to restrict my research to one gulag mm-hmm. only, and that was Verkuta, mm-hmm. because I wanted to be able to describe that place and Sense what went place. on there, mm-hmm. and not have any other sort of impinging into it. Um, I did subsequently go and have a look at it, some others. It was one of the coldest. It is one of the furthest north you can go, mm-hmm. and it's also a place still. The only way you can get to it is a three-day train trip from Moscow. Wow. There's no roads. There's no airport. 
Wow. So three yeah. day trip from yeah, Moscow. Really, really isolated. So did your researcher actually go there or did they just do no, research? She refused. She refused. <laughs> she said, can't imagine why. <laughs> can't imagine why. She said, please don't ask me. Please don't make me. But um, a lot of the documents from the Gulag from Bukuta had been brought down to Moscow mm -hmm. because Moscow now has uh, got archives of a lot of the Gulag's uh, documents. Uh, but she said, look, an awful lot haven't made it down. And she was told that. But she begged me not to put yeah, her on the train. train and send her up there. Send her up there. Um, when you were writing the tattooist, you had hours of speaking with Wally. Even yeah. though I really liked at the beginning, you never took a note. You were just listening to mm -hmm. what he had to say. In this situation, you didn't have that to work from. So no. it was a lot of intense research. What was that like? That you knew you weren't going to ever speak with her? Well, look, I knew that, but what I did have was other ladies in particular who were survivors of the Holocaust who could talk to me about her time in Birkenau. Mm -hmm. So there were these contacts that I had and, uh, and still have. One of them is still alive today. But in terms of what went on in Vukuta, no, there's no one who can tell me about that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. She spoke to people, friends and neighbours, where she lived in Kosciuszko in Slovakia. For 50 years she lived there. And though I have spent several times visiting that town and talking to them, and from them, people who knew her for decades, she shared a little bit of information with different ones. But she never really <laughs> talked about her story. They, yeah. I thought that was one of the most interesting things is that there's, she did not go back and say, this is what happened to me. It was, she changed her name. She, um, well, she, she just dropped her pet dro name of dropped Silka. Dropped her pet name of Silka. Right, so that anybody who knew her as Silka in the camps was not going to be able to find Silka. They were looking for Cecilia. So yeah, but here's the other thing. Very few Jewish people who even did survive mm -hmm. returned to Slovakia. Mm. And then Slovakia was under communist rule to right. what, 1985. So you mm -hmm. kept your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. You didn't Absolutely. say anything was going on. One of the men who um, lived next door to her and her husband, Mr. Samuel, he was 95 when I met him earlier this year for the first time. He told me that... Um, Silke's husband and him were both lawyers and they were both political prisoners and that the two of them were the only two who could ever talk in, in silence and talk about their experiences. Though he said that Silke's husband and his, their homes got raided all the time. Really? Uh, to take away paper because they would be writing up the stories of their imprisonment. Writing up what had and, happened um, and what had gone on. They wanted to make and, sure and that Silke's was... husband was a bit of a stickler. That he'd let them take them away and then he'd just write them again. And write the papers. And write them again. A couple of years later, in would come the Russians, the Soviets, and raid their house, take it all away. So when she was doing the research in Moscow, so much of the German, everything's been destroyed. Everything yeah. has been destroyed. And I think it was just because people realized that they could go to trial because of what was known and oh, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to get hung on this. I'm going to get hung about this. <laughs> in Russia, was everything destroyed the same way or you were able to actually go find things? I mean, no, it, it looks like documents were not destroyed because of fear of being persecuted or mm -hmm. prosecuted uh, by the people in the camps. A, they were not as good at keeping them in the first place, right, by, right. by all accounts. Um, and they didn't seem to care. So you know, some got destroyed, some didn't. I can't find any uh, actual reason that they would have all been destroyed in a gulag. Mm -hmm. uh, that they, they didn't care. They didn't care. And it, it was, were they keeping track of people the same way? Because I know no. that there's so much, there wasn't that keeping track. No, it was people coming in and out of uh, different gulags, because mm -hmm. people did swap around gulags. So they swapped different, yeah. Uh, but um, Silke never did. Mm -hmm. But we know her husband was not initially there, and then right. he was. Right. So that wasn't uncommon. It was, hey, where, where do we need work? And coal mines and keeping the coal flowing down to Moscow to be able to keep their industry and manufacturing going. And what they had actually done like, through the years is moving the people to, oh, we need this, uh, uh, get this 40,000 bodies, just move the bodies over here. Yep. Move whatever <clears throat> we're going to need all around the country for whatever we need to be and done. And they were not um, registered necessarily each time they changed camp. They, it was pretty sloppy from what I can account, but... Uh, yeah, which makes yeah, sense. That's a different mentality, isn't it? Yeah, it was totally different because it was just bodies moving around. Um, did you always enjoy just studying history? When you were in school, was that a passion of yours? In the sense that I lived in a very small town. It wasn't even a town in New Zealand. And to me, I never met anybody other than what we call the Maori and the Pākehā. Pākehā is the Maori word for white. And that was the total sum of any different nationality I knew. Wow. So I was drawn to Britannica Encyclopedia. My parents, we were on a farm, we didn't have, we didn't have television. 
And to me, reading about exotic places and people of other countries and, and races and religions, I loved it. I wanted to be like them. I wanted right. to visit them. And well, that, that kind of difference is, I saw as being um, a wonderful, and I still do. I, when you think about the encyclopedia, I mean, I, yeah. I'm of the age too, where you just sat and looked things up in the encyclopedia and you read, you read the encyclopedia. I'm going to sit there and I read the up. Encyclopedia Britannica, but that was my nighttime reading. It was, it was nighttime reading, looking up a different subject or, you know, what we were going to do. We have the internet now, but there yeah. was something about so concise about what you were going to read. It wasn't 50,000 things. It was yeah. just, this is the story of what happens mm -hmm. in this country. This is a map of what happens here. Yeah. And I just found it fascinating. And the geography of those places. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about the geography of trying to place um, a pyramid in Egypt you know, when you're sitting at the bottom of the world. Right. You know, what, where is that? Where does it fit into the scheme of things? Where does this all go? And I think that it was all those little snippets of history. I mean, I, we were talking earlier and I said, I never really loved studying history, but when in geography, when they said Pedro lives in Argentina, he wears a poncho, it, it was a person attached to it. Exactly. And I think that Lolly gave us that person to attach mm. it's so much about what was going on in the world. And the same thing with Silka. Did it always mean something to you that you wanted to have this person as you know the, the catalyst for your story? Well, it wasn't. I didn't set out for that. It happened by default. Mm -hmm. By meeting Lolly, I was only ever going to tell his story. And that's what was important to me. When I got to that point when I was researching what he was telling me and you know, trying to see where history and memory were you know, walking side by side and separating and what did that mean if I couldn't confirm through research something he told me. And um, I got to the point where I went, sod this, I could spend another lifetime doing this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not telling the story of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling a Holocaust story. One person's story. Yeah. This is what he remembers. This is through his lens of what, yes. he has, what happened. This is his memory. This is his memory of what happened. And if it is not exact, it is his memory of what happened through and, that experience. And nobody can uh, take that away from mm -hmm. him. Can't take your memory. No. Because no. it's like what you, what you were feeling at the time. Did you love... Okay, what did you do before you were writing this book, before you met him? Were you a screenwriter? Because I know this was originally a screenplay. <laughs> well, yeah, I wrote it as a screenplay. I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but to call myself a screenwriter is a really long bow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I was working in a hospital in Melbourne in the social oh. work department. So it was a, an acute hospital, you know, daily just dealing with the tragedy and trauma that came in that day. So do you think that that kind of an experience helped you? Because when you were talking to him, you know those moments to remain silent and just yeah, let him absolutely. speak. And I knew about the need to shut him down when I thought he'd been talking for enough. If he's getting distressed, mm -hmm. you know, topic change, mm -hmm. something contemporary. Mm -hmm. My football team's going to beat your football team, mm -hmm. and always look after him. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, I knew how to do that. Yeah, because if you're talking about trauma on an ongoing basis, it can definitely you're going to go to a very dark place. You're going yes. to go to a very dark place, and in your training would say. I know how to pull off. And just put him back out now. Jen, get him out. We'll talk about how much he makes bad coffee. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, the first day I met him, when he opened the door, and he had a, two dogs, one either side of him, and, and the big one. She's about the size of a small pony, and her name oh. was Tootsie. And the other one was this tiny little thing, about a cat size, and she was Bam Bam. And these two dogs were with him. He opened the door, and he just didn't look at me, and he said, come. And they turned around, he and the dogs, and they just appeared, went into this room, a lounge dining room, and he just pointed to a chair and he said, sit. And I sat, then he and the dogs disappeared. And they came back a few minutes later and he just plonked a cup of coffee in front of me. Never asked me how I wanted it. <laughs> I tried to hint a couple of times. And that was the first of many, many bad cups of coffee. <laughs> it was, and it's some <sighs> no way to be conducting a group of you interviews. You ain't getting out of that one. Yeah. You, you drank you it. Finish, when you finish the coffee, it's like, oh, this is going to be complete torture. This is going to be torture. As our friendship grew, I was able to say to him, mm, how about we go out today? <laughs> There's a good coffee shop just around the road. Let's go and have them sit there. There's something there. You know, kindness was something that was in very short order at these mm. camps. I mean, and there were these tiny little moments that people were doing wonderful things for each other. Whether it was, um, this is what I can do to uh, try to get you some little bit of extra food. I love the way yes. that everybody was always tucking food like up their sleeves. Mm -hmm. I always wondered like how you were doing that, like you know, tucking you know, food and hiding things from people. Yet there was a doctor that really embraced Silka and really changed her life in the yes. camp of what was going on. How did you stumble upon that story and what had happened with that woman? 
Asilka had spoken to somebody in Slovakia about her and I also knew because the same person told me that there were several occasions after they were both, well she was released, that she visited this doctor. She tracked her down back in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. Oh wow. And during communist rule still, she left Slovakia and went into the Soviet Union to uh, Sochi. Yeah, I think they had some Winter Olympic yeah, Games. Yeah, the Olympics, the Olympic Games there, yeah. And she was uh, working at the hospital here and Silka visited her three or four times when she could. So indebted to her was she for having saved her life. It is so many different moments and it was she was reading Silka and reading what was going on because there was mm -hmm. even one moment where it, as dark as tough as this place was she was actually in depression she was in she was and she was seeking her out of yeah. what happened what went on because I think that we think of every day is a depressing day but there are ones that are darker and worse yeah and I think that that was what you brought out and where this doctor would sit there and say well let's try something different for you let's just you know absolutely and, and, but she had access to drugs she could have ended her life mm-hmm at any time, just taken them and gone to sleep. And she would have been pushed to do that, but she stepped back. And this doctor helped her take that step back. Step back and say, and then they had her doing so many different things. You could also tell, and I think you mentioned somewhere along the way you found her report card from school, from the year she yes. went to school. She's very bright. And mm. she was picking up on things. She knew languages, which yes. was really not unusual because where people lived, they could learn like you know many different languages. Absolutely. But by the same token, to you know, take over the nursing role that she did and whatever, you had to be bright to be able to sit there and figure out what you were going to do and be yeah. able to keep up with the doctors. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting to learn that you can be trained as a nurse on the job. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Completely. Yes, you're going to deliver a baby by yourself. I'll be down the hall. Yeah, yeah, give, a, give us a holler. Uh, but that, that's the way, because I read a lot of reports about how they did just uh, grab girls and train them to be nurses, and she was one of those ones that did. Because what nurse in Moscow is going to say, put her hand up, uh, send me up to Borkuta, please? Exactly. I'm going to go up so there. A lot of the doctors were either volunteers mm -hmm. or they were coerced because they'd done something wrong wherever they lived. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, nurses, they more often than not were trained. And I read reports that whenever there was um, typhus that would sweep through, the camp, mm -hmm. then they would be grabbing other girls to train them as nurses and to put them in the special wards. Yeah, and it was so interesting when the one girl did, you know, encounter typhus and then what they were going to do to try to get her to be better. And it was, but I didn't understand is the whole camp, like I thought typhus was something like, you know, chicken box. Everyone was going to get it. Was it just that you were so debilitated that you would end up getting something like that? I think once again, it was lucky, you know, your constitution and uh, people survived it or they didn't. Now, Lali survived it, mm -hmm. Gita survived it. Mm -hmm. um, I've met this lovely lady in Tel Aviv a few months ago, and she was in um, Berna with uh, Gita, and she survived it as a 15-year-old. So you could survive it. Uh, it just depended, I guess, on your own individual constitution. You know, and, luck, and luck, and luck. And what these people often became was um, found family for each other. They yeah. created family. And I really love that, and I want you to share what happens where these women are actually taking the little they have and making it as special as they possibly can. Because I yeah. love those pieces of, we're going to find thread in unexpected places. Yes. And what they did to make needles was they would take a piece of straw out of their mattress and with a sharp end on it and create a little hole in the other end of it to make the eye to put the thread through. And yeah, one of the reports I read, a young girl who was in a particular hut, and she got sent to the hole, which is, she was right. there for two weeks, and she was really young, 13 or 14. And when she came back, every woman in that hut had been making lace for her, and they'd got a new uniform for her, and they decorated the collar and the sleeves and the pocket and everything as her welcome back to the hut. And that was where they were using the craft time. It was like, you know, when they go back in the evening, it was the yeah. one thing that they could use to express themselves mm. as opposed to being what told what to eat, where to walk, where to be counted, where to stand in the snow for hours. Yes. And it was that personal expression. They were lace makers. Mm -hmm. How beautiful. It's beautiful. And even when you were telling the one story about the one uh, woman who had a baby and then they were making baby clothes. And yep. you could tell that that was the thing that kept these people going was yeah. doing something it, while you're doing these terrible things when you come back in the evening, you've got your alone time. You're taking the sheet apart to, in order to come up mm. with the thread. Yeah. And during, of course, the summer, when mm -hmm. the, the sun the didn't summer, go down, yeah. your the, nights were quite long. Right, right, right. It could right. be as long as you wanted. 
Well, do you know, I was even um, realizing, we are talking about this just before October 31st, there's actually a celebration that happens every year, on uh -huh. October, or a commemoration that happens every year on October 31st. So listening, and I Isn't was, it called Halloween? Yeah, no, 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 actually there. Um, I was listening to the audio version, and it's also in the back of the book. It was very interesting about, they do a commemoration yeah. ceremony on October 31st. And it was like, you know, my timing of just reading about that now, where they do this remembrance of yeah. what happened there and what happened to the people. Um, it, I enjoyed listening on audio because my time is limited. Yep. And I would just get in the store, in the car, and I was like, well, this, well, there's times I had to just turn this off because her yeah. life was so difficult and it was so rough of what she was going through. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was sitting in traffic. It was nothing compared to what she was going through. But to hear a narrator, you know, it, it, the, the voices coming through for people who don't, do enjoy um, audio, yes. it's extremely well done. It's extremely oh, yes. Well so done. Thank you. I think she's delightful. She really, she's, she, she definitely personalizes yeah. the whole experience, which is just lovely. Um, I like that we got a view of so many different places in the camp. It was the hospital, because you really got in depth of what was going on. What was the research like, just to, because you said there were a lot of records of like, you know, what had happened yeah. in the hospitals. Was that easier to like, you know, come about because it's like, oh, I can like, see what happened there? Or is that yeah. really challenging as well? Well. I've actually got a photo of the exact hospital where she would have worked. Oh. We found an old, well, we've got many photos from Bokuta. I have seen a typical hut that she would have lived in with all the lace doilies on the wall mm. and this broken, cracked jug sitting on the stove with a half-dead flower coming out of it and, and a dog lying on the, on the floor. And, and so having that and knowing the layout, and it was really mishmash. Mm -hmm. I've been to Birkenau and Auschwitz where, once again, being German, everything's in a nice, neat row and it's lined up and right dressed. And uh, in Volkuta, there's a hut there, hut there, there. It's really a mishmash. Right. So trying to work out uh, how everybody could navigate around that and know where you were. And, and there's the one big gate that you exited every day to go to the mine to work. And, and, there's, you, and there are no gates around it because if you yeah. escape, you're not going anyplace. You'll no, be no. dead. You'll, You'll be, be dead, dead is what, what's going on. You know, I'm sure that there were many aha moments as you were writing. Is there one that you can recall that just sort of like, whoa, this is something that sort of stopped me in my tracks? Anything like that? When I was sitting talking to her neighbors in, uh, in Koshita, and we were talking a lot about, they knew a little bit about the Gulag, and that's what I was there to hear from them anyway, because I'd spoken to survivors in Australia about her being in a Birkenau. And they never mentioned Auschwitz. And so I asked the translator to say to this elderly couple in particular who really knew them, there were other neighbours that had come down too in the room, I said, would you ask Mr and Mrs Samuelie, did they know that she was in Auschwitz? Well, Mrs Samuelie, she nearly attacked me and she's yelling at me, how could you say that? That's a terrible thing to say. And getting really angry and get out of my house. I, mean, I couldn't understand her words, but they're being translated to me and I right. could see she's really angry. And I'm, my brain's going, what the heck? What's what going on it? here? Have I got the wrong Cecilia Klein? Is there two and I've mucked it up? But then I glanced at her husband, this lovely little man sitting beside her, 95, and he had his head down. I said, please ask Mr. Samuel, did he know that Cecilia had been in Auschwitz? And he shook his head, yes. I went, wow, got it, got it. Okay, now ask him, how long has he known and how did he know? And he explained that being a lawyer and being a friend of her husband, he often would just go next door and knock on the door. And there were several times Silke opened the door and she hadn't covered her arm up. Oh. And he saw her number. About that. So oh, yeah. he had, didn't ask Silke, uh, Silke. He asked her husband, is that what I think it is? His wife is sitting there absolutely wanting to throttle him. She's saying, how long did you know? And he went, oh, 30 or 40 years. You have kept a secret from me. That's something that I did so not know. So her anger just turned from me onto him, poor right. man. Oh, I was really concerned for his health after I left. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking of that because she, it's, it's been said that she didn't talk about her time of what was going on. And when mm. I was driving this morning, the one thing I was thinking of is, what about the tattoo? Mm. So she mostly could keep that covered up. Yeah. And then... If you saw that, it's like, wait a second, that was where what had happened. Yeah, because he then said to her, did you ever see Silke without long sleeves? And there were other women in the room too uh, who had cast aside to come to talk to me. And they're all going, um, yes, no, 
Maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they all agreed that they hadn't seen a number. A number on her all that time. Do people, did people have their tattoos removed? When some they did. Can, some did. Some were mm. able to be able to Gita do that. Did. She did. Gita did. Um, ten years before she died, so she would have been about, what, 68. And Lali said she was woke up one morning and just looked at him and said, get it off. I will not go another day with this on my arm. So something snapped in her. And I think it's, well, I think it's every day you'd sit there and remember. And it's, yeah. you know, just sitting there, that would be my one thing, is to just get rid of the one thing that would remind you every single day mm. of what had happened. And also, by being on your arm, it's not like it was on your back, it was on something, yeah. something you would see, you know, every day as you were, you know, moving around the house. But then the other uh, woman I met, and, and Dana from the book, who, mm -hmm. she's really Lottie, uh, she's mm -hmm. still alive. And I go and see uh, Lottie in Sydney when I'm there, and she proudly shows her number. Mm -hmm. And Lali made it for us. She tells this delightful story. She was also from Slovakia. And she knew Lully, but Lully didn't know her because she was uh, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. Lully was 25. And she told me that he worked in this department store. He was one of the managers there and that he was the best looking boy in town. And after school, she and her sisters used to go just to the department store to try and see him and look at him and giggle like schoolgirls do oh. and then run away. <laughs> so when he was then faced with her standing in line in um, oh, Birkenau oh. and she said it's me Lully and he said who he didn't know she said yeah it's Lottie from Bratislava and he then immediately started asking her questions what do you know what's going on back home what can mm -hmm. you tell me mm -hmm. and what he was doing that he wanted to talk to her. he has made her the biggest numbers ever Really? They are massive, you know, huge big numbers because he was taking his time. His time seeing her telling the yeah. story. And she tells, uh, she tells the story to anyone, and she was a guide at the Holocaust Centre in Sydney, that um, he did that. And then they met up again after the war, and they were together in Bratislava together. Lali and Silke and Gita came down, and she and her husband, they found each other again in Australia. Mm. And every time they got together, uh, Lali would approach her with his head down because she would give him a smack. That's for my big number. <laughs> That's for my big number for telling you all the gossip from back in town yeah, of what was going had, on. Yeah, none. I didn't exactly. realize until I'd read this book um, how many people uh, migrated to Australia yeah. later on. And what was the reason? Was it just getting out of Dodge? Far, get it far away, an ocean away from you where everything it. Was, was at this point. Furthest place from Europe. They either went there or they went to Israel. Oh, okay. Mm. So it was one or the other. Have you been to Israel? Yes, yes. And have you spoken there or is it just... Um, and no, I was there in June uh, meeting a lady mm -hmm. with a story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. Um, you know, it, I, when I was reading it, it felt like Asilka was a bit angelic at times because she was doing so much good. I mean, there were two instances that I won't spoil for anybody who hasn't read the book yet where she could have done something advantageous for herself and she didn't. And we're, when you were talking to people, were they saying that that's something that they saw in her? Absolutely. That she was of um, herself? Absolutely. And it's, you don't need to draw a long bow to work out that what she was doing in Birkenau, where every day all she did was put women on a truck to go to the gas chamber. Her life there was about death and death only. Now, we can never get inside her head to how that would have affected her. But by knowing what she became as an older woman, she would have looked for every opportunity to try and turn back that clock. Because when she was, when she was in Birkenau, just to, for those who haven't read the book, when she was, it was Block 25, yeah. Block 25, mm -hmm. and it was where the sick, the, the people that they didn't think were going to be able to help anymore. To, to it was just the, the women cost, they wanted to get rid of. They wanted to get rid of. She was in charge of that block. So she yeah. would see those women that night, and the next morning she'd know that all those people were going to be dead. Yes. A tragedy. A, tra Absolutely. a tragic way to be living life. And she was put into that block because there would never be any witnesses to what was going on with mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. So what was happening? Because then this commandant could be doing what he wanted to do because mm -hmm. by the next day everybody would be gone. Yeah. Um, would you think she was kind of lucky in a place where luck was in short supply as well? Uh, yes. She was. Lali was. Gita was. Mm -hmm. Every survivor who survived was lucky. Everybody was just a little bit lucky. They all said I was lucky. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, one of the, um, the really interesting things is these people are living under extreme duress that there's no cut and dry between good and evil. It's no. not exactly the way we know bad, no. good. Nope. nope. Um, and can you blame them? Mm -mm. 
And look, I read this lovely, one of the a testimony of a woman who had been in Birkenau. She didn't live in Australia, I never met her. But there was this one statement that totally hit me. When we survived and we got back home, we all portrayed ourselves as angels in that death camp, mm -hmm. when in reality, none of us were. We all did things we would never, ever do under different circumstances. Right, and it was either hiding, stealing, it didn't have to be, it, it didn't have to be Even the Even dobbing worst. in. Right, Yeah, right. That, that went on. Right. Um, prisoner would turn against prisoner. Mm -hmm. Just to get something to survive. It was yeah. all about survival. You know, when I was young, I read the diary of Anne Frank, as I'm yep. sure just every other girl did. Mm -hmm. And I used to spend nights lying in bed and times walking around wondering if I would have survived, if my family would have yeah. survived. I'm convinced that my sister would have sneezed, that something would have happened and we would have been found. And I think that that was such a drawing because it was one girl's story. Exactly. And that's really what you've done with these two stories. It's, it's one person's story. Was that something that was important to you? Oh, absolutely. Um, and how lucky am I that I can get a love story in mm -hmm. with them as well. And I didn't make it up, it happened. My Hollywood ending for Lully and Gita That's exactly. actually happened. Right. And for Silka. And for Silka. Yeah. It's like, you know, what ended up happening. Did you read Diary of Anne Frank when yes, you were young? Yes, I did. And did you... That was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but when you read it, were you um, surprised? Do you, can you remember your feelings when you were reading that book? Look, I can because it was once again something so foreign anything I'd known about and we had no Holocaust uh, studies at school. Mm. Oh, that you didn't? Have, no, not, not. At the school I went to, particularly as a primary school, I had two classrooms. So very small. Very small. And um, unfortunately for New Zealand, in terms of educating you about the Second World War, well, unless the New Zealand Army was there, then it didn't mm. happen. Mm -hmm. Very sad. But um, I, yes, look, I remember reading about it too and it just struck me there's being almost um, a fantasy. Mm -hmm. How did this didn't really happen? It couldn't happen, and I actually really couldn't grasp it. Yeah, and it was like you know, to, this is what happened today. Today is my birthday. That we're going to do this very small thing, yeah. and I feel like this is when I was reading these two books. I was thinking back on that even more because it was such a personal story of exactly. what had ended up happening and, and what had gone the on. The ones that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, they're the ones that matter, and that's what's going on. Um, when you spoke with people who knew Silka. Were they excited that you were going to be telling her story? What were oh, their feelings? Absolutely. Because to them, she also was this incredible woman who should have her story told, even though they didn't know much about her story. But to them, she was this amazing, compassionate, loving woman. The girls who I mean, there were women who I'm now meeting in their 40s and 50s in the apartment building where they were born there. Wow. And they still live there. And they would tell me how. They would come home from school, particularly in the middle of winter, and it would be snow on the ground and they'd be freezing, and their parents would still be at work and they'd be locked out. And Silka every afternoon would go down to see any locked out children, take them up to her apartment, give them hot drinks and keep them mm. there. Mm. And this was what she did. Uh, caretaking moment. She absolutely. Was caretaking. She looked after everybody in the building. And she did not have children of her own. No, sadly mm -hmm. she didn't. No, and it, it, every neighbour I met who said, she would have loved children. She would have loved to have she children. She often spoke about how she would have loved children. And, you, um, and we know, though, how much she loved her husband. Mm -hmm. Because these women, these elderly women who she had knew for decades, would tell me, ah, she always go on about how much she loved her husband. Why she go on about that? We don't have to say it. And they'd look at their husbands and go, I'm not going to tell him I love him. But Silka, she, or Cecilia, mm -hmm. called her Cecilia, she say it all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was, do you think it was because of all the years that she couldn't say how she felt and she couldn't do what she wanted, that she felt yeah. that she could express? Absolutely. And she was absolutely devoted to him and, and likewise him to her. Mm -hmm. the, this couple who lived in that one building for 50 years, known by so many neighbours and friends, and they stood out as being a, a beacon of love. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. You, rem um, you changed the name of her husband like, yes. of her f to protect the family, which I thought was a very wise thing to do because the last thing that everybody would need was people coming after them of saying, you know, or trying to seek them out and find the family at the same time. But meanwhile, her son has come out recently and said things, and the Holocaust Museum people have come out and said things. 
But you're always referring back that this is a story, this is fiction, this is one person's story. Mm -hmm. It's not, you've never said that this is completely historical fact. It's based on fact. Can you elaborate on that? Because I find oh, that absolutely. so interesting. Um, Silke's husband had a child to a previous partner. And Silke and her husband met him again as an adult only and on a handful of occasions. And so they, they were never a family unit. And so what I have taken and learned from my sources are people who in fact did know her and her husband for decades. Mm -hmm. So they have the knowledge and the storylines. And so yes, to enable this gentleman because he indicated to me he wanted to tell his father's story. Mm -hmm. So he now has the freedom to do that and it's not in any way going to be impinged on by Silka's story. Mm -mm. Why was that important to you to make sure that it's not being viewed as nonfiction? It is a person's story. Well, to write this as a memoir, just take Lully's, for example. To write it as a memoir or biography, I was told that I would be restricted in what I could put in it. Mm -hmm. I would not be able to put Gita in there because unless he was with her, then she didn't exist in that camp. Mm -hmm. um, I would not be able to have conversations and dialogue mm -hmm. because you don't put that in unless you know for certain you've got a recording this was what was said and everything Lali told me was said in conversation with me and so I wanted to be able to create the atmosphere and the environment as it was told to me and that meant yeah creating the scene and setting the scenes mm -hmm. through his eyes and it was never going to always tie in with the accurate historical account but, but, but what is facts. Mm -hmm. The facts of whatever anybody at any point in time determines they are. Here's a fact that's no longer a fact. When you look up Silke's name at Yad Vashem, the United States Holocaust Center and other archives, she is listed as having been murdered in Auschwitz. And when you see that and you go, I'm sure, she, I know she wasn't mm -hmm. because Lali's wife Gita visited her mm -hmm. and corresponded with her. But that's what the facts say on the official documents. I have now seen her birth registration in a little town called Sabanov in Slovakia. And there, at the end of her birth registration, I noted writing in a different pen and in a, clearly a different hand. And when I asked the translators to tell me what it said, they said that on this date in 1958, Cecilia Klein visited this office with a document from Bratislava recording and registering her as to be a citizen of the state of Czechoslovakia. Wow. There's the fact. Mm -hmm. And so fact, fiction, they don't always mix either. Mm -mm. No, and sometimes you have to take poetic license in order to tell a story, yes. in order to make the story flow. If you did everything in exact like this, there'd be a lot of very boring days in the middle yeah. of what, what was happening. Yeah, particularly with, with tattooists, what I'm mm -hmm. really, really clear on, my timeline is um, absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm. When I have um, the Mengele coming in, the Chipsies coming in, all those aspects are timeline driven mm -hmm. and I did not muck around with them in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't get to do that. No, no, you can sit there and do dialogue. You can do different things that happened on, you can compress a day. Yeah. You can compress a week into a day, but you can't compress facts completely, completely out of line. Exactly. And there's been pushback on, did the commandants really have sex? Did they really, you know, did it? When we're now realizing in this Me Too world, how mm -hmm. much is coming out of what has happened that people just would not talk about before. I mean, I think that were women just never going to share that because they thought that then their lives would be tainted? Well, absolutely. They were ashamed and shamed for decades into silence. And yeah, I'm allowed to say I just find it absolutely absurd to think that you could send an edict down that no German should have sex with a Jewish girl and every German soldier go, oh, okay, right, got your her, Hitler. Right. Yeah, right. Come on, get real. Right. And we're all in the same place and she's really cute and well, this, I'm alone. And they had that power advantage over them. Mm -hmm. I've read reports and some of the survivors I spoke to in, in Australia who worked in the Canada where Gita worked initially. Mm -hmm. And they told me that they would be in these big buildings and all the belongings had come in, there's clothing and books and they were sorting through them, the bags. And um, there'd be a pile of clothing there and one of the SS would just come in and grab one of the girls and just blatantly in front of everybody, you know, rape her. 
and just move on. And that went on because every day. Everybody was anonymous in the room. It was, yeah. it was, Everybody was chattel. That was like what I, when yeah. I was reading these books, that's what I felt like. Everybody was chattel and they could be used as you felt like using them. Used and abused. Mm -hmm. Used and abused on an ongoing basis. If you could talk to Silka now, is there one question you'd like to ask her? Oh, you know, it's one I want the answer to, but it's not my pace to, I wouldn't ask it to her. Um, how did she go on another day? after she had put her mother mm. on the truck to right. go to her death. Right, right. That would be the one. Yes. Mm. And how could, you, how could you possibly do that? Yeah. How could you possibly go on from there? So there's a movie that's being made of The Tattooist. Well, it's not a movie. It's actually a six-part miniseries. Which I actually see as the big thing these days. I don't really yeah, love right. going to Two the theater. Two hours theater. versus six hours, no contest. Exactly, exactly. And, and also, if it's delivered all at the same time, all the better. Just oh, sit down and watch right, right back to yeah, back. Yeah, you know? Please do a stream dump. <laughs> please, please just do a stream dump, yes. And then you can just sit there and you know, spend your weekend watching. Um, what's next for you? Is there another story? Look, I been lucky to have storylines now given to me and to my publishers mm -hmm. from people all around the world. Mm -hmm. Incredible stories. They all have to be told. Can I tell them all? It depends. Can I hang in there until I get to Margaret Atwood's age? I'll try. <laughs> but um, there are a couple of them in particular which are standing out to me and I kind of alluded a little bit to one of them in Tel Aviv where I will be back in January. Oh, how lovely. Yeah, amazing, amazing stories coming my way. They're all full of hope and resilience and, and love. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because your style of writing is one where it's very cinematic. It's very cinematic and feeling. So you feel like you're you know, very, very much in the place. And that's been such a pleasure. Oh. So That's what happens when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> You just said they're in the right place. I don't know how doing. to write. Yes. yes. I didn't know how to write a novel. No. So then you worked with an editor that did or work with you on yeah, it? Yeah. Um, but for the most part, they ended up conceding, oh, just write the way you want to write it. Because mm -hmm. they had initially said, yeah, memoir, biography. Okay, now write in the third person. And I'm trying all these things. I'm saying, mm, not working for me. Yeah, just write. So they said, just write. Right. It's been a pleasure. The two very, very interesting books. They're books that I know book clubs are talking about. I know yes, that readers yes. are talking about. Do you talk to book clubs? Yes, absolutely. You, you talk to book I clubs? Skype into them in the weirdest places. Oh, I love Small that. Place, um, towns in Spain and all out of the country. So if people wanted to do, to do that with you, can they just get in touch on your website and if absolutely. you're free? Oh, well, that'd be wonderful. So anybody who likes to do that, um, I know I've done it with our book club and it's mm -hmm. really a way to make the experience a lot richer and get your questions answered. Because Look, if you're sitting down having um, a glass of wine and some cheese, then I will match you in my lounge room or wherever I am with a glass of wine and some cheese. We'll be able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you so much for joining oh, us today. Gosh, thank you so much. Been a pleasure, absolutely. And everyone, till next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.